Good evening. Good evening. And welcome in the name of our suffering Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is the first day of Lent, a season of contrition and repentance, and it is Ash Wednesday, a day when many Christians mark themselves with an ashen cross to remind themselves of their mortality and sin. But the sign of the cross is made, the ashes are made in the sign of the cross to remind us of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and despite our sin, the salvation that he has given to us. The ashes for Ash Wednesday oftentimes come from the palms of the previous Palm Sunday, also reminding us how fleeting the earthly glory is and how it will not last. But again, the eternal salvation of our Lord does last. This evening, as we have the imposition of the ashes, I remind you that this is optional. This is not a sacrament. This is not something that is commanded by Scripture. It is an outward sign that many Christians find helpful to remind them of their repentance and sin during the season of Lent, but it is not something that offers a special blessing or something that gives us anything other than what the Word of God gives us in the service this evening. And so as we begin our opening hymns, we would just ask that if you desire to have the ashes imposed upon you, simply come up here and line up in the center aisle during the opening three hymns. rise to make our beginning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I ask you before God, who searches the heart, do you sincerely confess that you have sinned against God and deserved his wrath and punishment? Truly you should confess, for Holy Scripture declares, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Do you heartily repent of all your sins, committed in thought, word, and deed, in what you have done and in what you have left undone? I do repent. Truly you should repent, as did the penitent sinners throughout the Bible. King David, who prayed for a contrite heart, Peter, who wept bitterly, the sinful woman, the prodigal son, and others. Do you believe that God, by grace, for the sake of Jesus, will forgive all your sins? I do believe. Truly you should believe. For Holy Scripture declares, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you intend, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, to amend your sinful life? I do intend. Truly you should so intend. For Christ our Lord says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Finally, do you believe that through me, a called servant of God, you will receive the forgiveness of all your sins as from God himself? I do believe. 
As you believe, even so may it be unto you. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto each of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. We give thanks to you, almighty God, for this gracious gift of salvation. Be with us through all of our days, and let us never turn from the faith you have given us by the power of your holy word. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your mercy, out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for Ash Wednesday comes from the prophet Joel, the second chapter, beginning at the 12th verse. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the and protector of our faith. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
The epistle reading comes from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, the fifth and sixth chapters. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel comes to us according to St. John, the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. We now confess together our Christian faith, speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, Ash Wednesday, is the day when many of us visibly bear the marks of our sin. The Ashen Cross, it's not just a cool way to mark yourself as a Christian. It is a reminder of our mortality because of our sin. It is a tangible stain that shows our guilt and our depravity. It's a visible indicator that you know you are a sinner and that because of that fact, you will die. But that's something we know every day, not just Ash Wednesday. Each of us daily bears the mark of our sin, our mortality, our guilt, our shame, our memories of all the sinful things that we've done, not just recently, but throughout our entire lives. Imagine, though, if those marks were visible to everyone. If our past showed up as a visible stain one day, how marked up would we be? What pictures would we see in the mirror? The face of someone we hurt? The amount of money that we wasted? All the couldas and shouldas. I could have been a better dad, mom, son, or daughter. I should have paid closer attention to that person's hurts and needs. I could have helped them, but instead I made things worse. Dig around in the basement of your life. Look at all your marks of sin, and what do you feel? Wasted years, obsessive greed, diversions that were destructive, anger, arrogance, selfishness, filthy talk, leading others into sin. Years and years and years of guilt and regret and shame, leaving scars and painful reminders all throughout our lives. What can we do with all of our unwanted marks? Well, one option is that we can be defensive about them. When we're defensive, we don't admit a thing. We tell no one. We keep the skeleton safely locked up in the closet. We seek innocence, not forgiveness. When we're defensive, we reduce life to one goal. Hide the secret, the sin, the shame. Cover it up. Don't address it, don't admit it, and whatever we do, never, ever confess it. If someone tries to bring it into the light, we fight tooth and nail, claiming that it's not sin, saying that it never happened, that there were special circumstances that nobody else would ever understand. We say excuses like, everyone else is doing it, so why are you picking on me? We turn the tables around and tell everyone that they're not perfect either, so they should leave you alone. Be defensive, and make sure that those marks never see the light of day. Well, another option is to be defeated. When we're defeated, we feel as though we don't make mistakes, we are mistakes. We didn't just foul up, we are a foul up. We beat ourselves up repeatedly with blame and shame of the past. We see the marks of the past and assume that those marks are our future as well. We see no way to remove or to change the marks, so why even bother trying? We take the role of judge, jury, and accusing attorney, and the verdict, guilty forever. Defensive people hide the marks of their sin. Defeated people replay the marks of their sin. And we've all done both many, many times. Are those our only two options? Hide the sin or be ruled by it? Well, of course not. We can be defensive, we can be defeated, or we can be delivered. As we begin Lent on this Ash Wednesday, we also begin our sermon series called Witnesses to Christ focusing on people who witnessed Jesus with their own eyes, saw his ministry, and more importantly, his journey to the cross. And the first witness that we look at is one who, oddly enough, wasn't even present during Holy Week, John the Baptist. Years before Jesus' crucifixion, at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry, John the Baptist was killed by King Herod. So how is he a witness of the cross? Because his ministry, his sole duty, was to remind people that they were indeed sinners and then bear witness to the one person who could save them, Jesus Christ, the Deliverer. 
to those who are defensive about their sin, pretending that they aren't sinners, that their sin isn't so bad, John brings the hammer of God's law, smashing the hiding places that we've built in our lives so we can pretend that there's nothing wrong with us. He calls us to repent, to admit that we are guilty, that we are in desperate need of a Savior. Not just the Pharisees, but all of us who hide our sin away, he calls whitewashed tombs. We may look good on the outside, but inside we are filled with death and decay. To those who claim to have no sin, he brings the jarring yet necessary truth to our eyes, forces us to see those marks that we have tried so hard to ignore. But he doesn't stop there. What does John the Baptist say to sinners? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When it comes to all of our ugly marks, whether we're defensive about sin or defeated by sin, we can be delivered from sin. Behold, he begins. Behold literally means see. It's a command, a proclamation. The verb can be translated as look, gaze, stare, take note. Behold means here is the whole point of what I'm saying. John the Baptist doesn't just point out our sin. He bears witness to our Savior, pointing our eyes to our deliverer from sin. Behold, he says, as he points to Jesus. Twice as Jesus passes by, John the Baptist says to those around him and to each of us as well, Behold the Lamb of God. This isn't an ordinary lamb, just cute and fluffy and cuddly. This is the Lamb of God. This is the Passover Lamb. Passover, of course, was the Jewish holiday commemorating their freedom from Egyptian slavery. It looked back on the last of the plagues where the angel of death was unleashed upon the land of Egypt, striking down the firstborn of every household. Every household, that is, except those marked by the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb is a male lamb, perfect, spotless, and without defect. It is innocent. It has nothing to do with Egypt. It is in no way responsible for Israel's slavery. But so that Israel may live, the Passover lamb must die. The Israelites are to kill the Passover lamb and place its blood on the sides and the tops of their door frames, marking their house with a visible sign. This innocent blood would ward off death and set the Israelites free, free from their life of slavery, servitude, and fear. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, cries John. Not took away, because the work of the Lamb is still ongoing when John bore witness. Not will take away, like someday, if we're lucky, we'll get to experience that. The verb takes away is in the present tense. Meaning what? Meaning that Jesus continually takes away. Today he takes away. Tomorrow he takes away. Next week he takes away. He is always present and active. Not waiting to do something great down the road. Not giving you a one-time cleansing and then expecting you to sustain it. He takes away. And what does he take away? He takes away the sins of the world. He suffers and dies in the place of all sinners, pays the price of every single transgression and atrocity. Billions upon billions of sins were laid upon that innocent lamb, and he died under the weight of them. All the sins of the world were paid for with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. But not just the sins of the world, your sin, your ugly sin, your shameful sin, your haunting sin, your every single sin, Jesus takes it away. Your guilt, your shame, all the dirty marks of your sin, all your regretful actions, all the sins that you didn't even realize were there, all of it is paid in full, removed from you completely by your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, the sins of your life. Sin has marked us. Sin has filled our lives with guilt and shame. Sins that we've committed, sins that others have committed against us. We bear the marks of divorce, 
alcoholism, addiction, pornography. We're marked by shame as our children fall away from the church. Our friends betray us. We lose our job, our house, our life savings. Skeletons from the past that we thought we were done with show up to haunt us more. All the shameful things that have happened to us, all the dirty, terrible things that we've done to ourselves and to others, all the things that we've worked so hard to keep hidden from everyone but have come to light, even the things we're still somewhat successful in hiding away, they all mark us with guilt and with shame. What can we do? We try to come up with our own solutions. We put our hands over our ears, we wash, splash water on our face, go for a long drive, self-medicate. We try to talk it out with a friend or a counselor, but nothing takes away our shame. Nothing takes away our guilt. Sin has marked us, and that's that. End of story, right? But it's not. We don't have to drink our sin away, work our sin away, explain our sin away, eat our sin away, cry our sin away, or bury our sin away. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This may be hard to believe. Most of us have carried our ugly marks for so long that we can't imagine life without them. Maybe we can't imagine that, but God can, and God does. God does more than just imagine it. He makes it so. He sends John the Baptist who says to each and every one of us sinners, Behold, look, gaze, see, this is the whole point of what I'm saying. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover Lamb of God does it all for the whole world. The Passover Lamb of God does it all for you. And so we behold the Lamb and we pray. Jesus, take it all away. Confess your sin. Unburden yourself of the sin others have done to you. Tell Jesus what you did, what you said, what you saw, what you took, how you feel. Tell Jesus what you thought. Pray this prayer as often as needed. Once, twice, ten times a day. Hold nothing back. No guilt is too ancient or too recent. No shame is too evil or too insignificant. No marks are so malicious that they can't be completely removed by the grace of God. And what do you need grace for? For being a bad person? That's too general. Examine your life and confess real sins. Did you lose your patience at a meeting and call your coworker a rude name? Do you often take God's name in vain? Do you struggle with addiction and keep on failing? Look at your life, confess real sins. Because confession isn't punishment for sin. Confession names the sin so it can be exposed to God's amazing grace so you can be set free forever. Be firm in this prayer. Satan traffics in guilt and shame, and he won't give up without a fight. When he says, oh, that's not really a sin. When he says, oh, you don't need to bring that up. When he says, God couldn't forgive you of that. Say to Satan, behold, the Passover lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's time for a clean start, a fresh slate, a new beginning. That's what Lent is about. We don't need to be defensive or defeated. Today and always, we can be delivered. And we do that by looking at God's marks. Yes, God has marks too. Not the marks of sin like we have. His are the marks on his hands, on his body. His are the marks of love and sacrifice. The marks of his atoning death that sets you free. Behold, look. See, gaze, this is the whole point of what I'm talking about. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, he says through the prophet Isaiah. Jesus has your name written where he can see it. Your name is on his blood-stained hands. Yes, Jesus loves you that much. If you've ever wondered if God could really forgive you, if you've ever wondered if Jesus is really willing to take away all your marks, If you've ever wondered what God would do if he ever found out about it all, then frame these words and hang them on your wall. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Trust these words. Believe these words. Stand firm in these words and trust in Jesus Christ 
to take it all away because he took the nails on a cross. On a God-forsaken cross, Jesus Christ took the nails for you. And taking those nails, Jesus takes away all of your sin and all of your shame. He hung there for us. And still, Jesus says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. In the end, these are the only marks that matter. These marks on Christ's hands, they will never be erased, ever. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And by his cross alone, by his empty tomb alone, you are forgiven of every one of your sins, and eternal life in heaven is yours. To God alone be all glory, now and forever. Amen. And now that peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. O God of forgiveness and love, you know the transgressions of our hearts, bodies, and minds. Break our hearts over our sins and cleanse and renew them by your holy word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Lord, you have called your people to be reconciled to you in Christ. Grant steadfast, pure, and courageous hearts to your pastors that through all things they would remain ministers of your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you instruct your people in the way of righteousness. Grant us faithful hearts that in the Lenten days to come, we would serve you and our fellow man in selfless love and find our reward only in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Lord, you blot out transgressions and wash away iniquity. Sustain the families of your church that husbands, wives, and children would be cleansed from their sins and live together in peace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, look graciously on our nations and its leaders, all civil servants, and all those who protect us and work for the common good. Drive away all disease and fear from us. Grant peace, we pray, in our days. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, behold in mercy all those who are sick, who suffer, and those who rejoice. Be with all expectant mothers, all whose work is dangerous, the unemployed, those near death, and those who mourn. Comfort us who are dust and must return to dust with the promise that a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to offer himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Trusting in his mercy, bring us in repentance and faith to your altar to eat his body and drink his blood for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Again, a welcome to all of you. And as we gather together in somber repentance for Ash Wednesday, it is also a time of joy as we look to the cross of Jesus Christ and we see not just the suffering that he endured for our sake, but the salvation that he won for us, that he gives to us freely through his cross and his empty tomb. We invite you to join us for the, all of the Wednesday evening services throughout Lent as pastors from our circuit, the Clinton Circuit. Uh, LCMS pastors join us and share in the Lent rotation, looking at various witnesses of Jesus Christ, of his passion, and all those who guided us to look upon Jesus and see our salvation and our redemption. We also invite you to join us now for a time of refreshments and fellowship in the fellowship hall. God's richest blessings to each and every one of you on the rest of your week, and may he bring you back safely to his holy house in the days and weeks to come.